Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, hello there, I'm your host Simon Wimes here, one of my writers, in this case George, thank you George has written me, a script, Las Vegas shooting, America's worst mass shooting. This is, uh, this was, this was a 2017, six years ago, I believe, and it's one of those moments where it's just so bad and so beyond anything that's come before it that you just, you see it in the news and you're like, I'm witnessing a moment in history, sort of, I think a I mean, it's different, obviously, but I think back on 9-11 in the same way and seeing that in the in the news. And I think I was 13 at the time, 14. And it's just like, whoa, I'm seeing history. I'm seeing one of the most important moments in history unfold on the television. And it's weird being a part of that. And I remember seeing the news of the Las Vegas shooting and feeling the same way and thinking like, this is a big deal. This is a lot more than normal, and uh, hopefully this will change something. I'm not sure if it did, because there's still mass shootings. I don't, you know, there's been nothing this big since, but surely it's only a matter of time. I don't, I don't know. And I remember this guy had like a homemade automatic gun or something. He managed to take like a gun and make it automatic somehow using is it a modified stock or something like that it's just like crazy that this this can happen anyway obviously we're going to dive in this is probably going to be a bit of a rough one so let's jump into it if you're new here the format of the show is i've not read this before uh we're going to explore it together so so let's jump in it's hard to imagine a worse crime than a mass shooting the epitome of senseless violence, their horrific and barbaric affairs in which lives are ended wholesale without warning, without reason, without restraint. But even this doesn't quite convey it correctly. There is something about such crimes, and the way they transform ordinary locations, the kinds usually typified by peace, tranquility, and above all else, happiness, into scenes of unforgettable tragedy that makes them sting in a way that other crimes simply can't. Yeah, I, I agree. It's kind of just one of those things where you're like, yeah, I could just be in a supermarket. I could just be at work not the sort of place where you'd ever expect a crime and then just for that to be turned into just something so crim- criminal it's just it's yeah i mean what other words are there to describe it there are no words regrettably america has an all too familiar acquaintance with such violent incidents be it the sandy hook shooting where 26 lives including those of 20 children were ended in the corridors of an elementary school or the pulse nightclub massacre where 49 innocent lgbt people fell victim to hatred and bigotry the incidents have become an all too familiar feature of the nation's news cycle i couldn't believe how many mass shootings there are or like just shootings in general there's a whole wikipedia page of it and i thought oh these are things that happen every couple of years but those are only the big ones the small ones of like four or five people they happen with shocking regularity america but even amongst this lonesome litany one stands out above the rest for its calculated brutality the callousness of its execution and above all else the sheer number of lives that it claimed the las vegas shooting of october the 1st 2017 here, in the heart of the city's vibrant strip, a music festival and the hotel overlooking it became the tragic setting for the deadliest mass shooting in modern American history, with over 60 innocent lives lost and over 800 people injured. The tragedy left an indelible scar on the face of a nation and forever darkened a city that previously had been known the world over for its glittering lights, high-stakes entertainment, and unending revelry. This is the story of that tragedy, and they warned everybody, this is a heavy one. The shooting. It all began at the Mandalay Bay Hotel when security officer Jesus Campos was out about patrolling its quiet corridors. Campos was no stranger to the job, and for him, his daily march around the hotel had become ritualistic, checking doors to make sure they were secure, identifying safety hazards, and occasionally stopping to exchange pleasantries with guests. These were the bread and butter regularities of his profession. Certainly, this is not what one would call adrenaline pumping, but little did he know a disturbance most wicked was about to change that. At 9.18pm, a call came out to campus over his radio. An alarm was blaring out in a suite on the 32nd floor, and as the hotel had been unable to raise the occupants with its internal telephone, it fell to campus, who was only two floors down, to head up and check it out. This was no cause for campus to worry, however, at least not yet. Such alarms were routine things, and they occurred many times throughout the day. Typically, it was something asinine, someone smoking in their room and tripping the fire alarm, a tipsy guest getting lost and staggering through a fire door, something like that. 
But as Campos ascended to the 32nd floor, he began to see signs that the matter at hand was far from routine. His first clue being that the door that led to the hallway from the stairwell had been secured shut. Given that this was a heavy fire door, intended to stay unlocked in all situations barring emergencies, this made Campos raise an eyebrow. It had to have been done intentionally. There was no way a rogue child or drunken staggerer would have been able to accidentally lock it shut. Its mechanism was just too substantial. But still, despite his initial intrigue, his mind raised no alarm bells. After all, the situation he was stumbling into was so unusual, so unexpected, so evil. How could he have been expected to have any other response? Unable to open the door, Campos headed back down the stairs and instead used a guest elevator to reach his destination, a route that he did not find obstructed. Soon enough, he found himself at the suite in question, suite 32125, and he found himself greeted by another strange sight. Someone had screwed an L bracket between the door and its frame, securing it tight. Sensing something weird was afoot, he knocked on the door, and when he received no answer, he got on his radio and summoned an engineer to help him get the door open, pacing down the hallway as he talked. As he put down his radio, he heard the muffled echoes of a very loud, almost industrial sound coming from inside the suite. It was unclear what it was, but given its volume and rapidity, almost very like a large power drill, he headed back over to investigate once again. He pressed his ear to the door, but whatever sound it was, it was well enough muffled by the luxury suite's extensive soundproofing that he simply couldn't place it. He remained there, pressing his ear against the door as he pondered when suddenly the penny dropped. It was gunfire, very fast, very rapid, thunderously loud gunfire. Instantly, his fight-or-flight instincts kicked in, and he dived for cover in an alcove between suites 122 and 124. Unfortunately, he had him in fast enough, as the very instant he began to dive for cover, a ferocious volley penetrated the door, striking Campos in his left leg. Mercifully, his wounds were minor. The great mass of the fireproof door had reduced the velocity of the round so much that it made his injuries minimal. Minimal enough for him to believe that he had only been hit with something small, like a BB gun or a 22 caliber rifle. So, with himself safe for now, he did the only thing he could think to do in that situation. He kept his head down and tried to raise the alarm over the radio. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, call the police, get them up there. Because right now, he's just like there's a madman in the room with a gun. Why would he have any suspicions that he's about to blow out a window and start shooting people in a crowd below? Right, because if I remember this correctly, there's a large crowd at a concert and this madman's shooting them from a 32-story, 32nd story window. He'd have no reason to suspect that. He just probably thinks there's a madman in the room with a gun who's just in there and it'd be like cool we'll get the police here there'll be a negotiator and we'll get him out of there or we'll just raid in and, and shoot him he wouldn't have any reason to think that he wouldn't like you'd think why doesn't he go in there and stop the shooting because he doesn't know he doesn't think there is any shooting he just thinks he's shooting at him even he didn't know who he was Meanwhile, at the festival, the scene was one hell itself. The shooting began at 10.05 p.m. The shooter had taken up a position on the sill of one of two windows that had earlier smashed with a hammer and opened fire just as the headline act Jason Aldean was getting into his closing number. Initially, he just took a few isolated single shots to gauge his aim, and then, having adjusted his windage in elevation, he welded his finger to the trigger and unleashed an unrelenting barrage on the poor crowd below. The shooting was to continue for exactly 10 minutes, a time long enough to allow the shooter to discharge over a thousand rounds, mostly in unrelenting bursts of 80 to 100 rounds that emptied entire high-capacity magazines with a single trigger pull. Amidst the noise and action of the festival, many on the ground mistook the early shots for fireworks or simply didn't notice them at all. Tragically, this illusion was soon shattered as festival goers began falling to the floor by the dozen. A mass panic then emanated across the festival as this grim realization set in. A brave few remained on the scene, doing what they could to keep low and administer first aid to the initial victims, but the majority, quite understandably, tried to flee. Unfortunately, their escape was hampered by the festival's perimeter security fence. Once a symbol of protection, the fence and its limited number of gates were now a bottleneck, slowing down escape and leaving many attendees penned in in the shooter's line of fire. Also on the ground were several police officers who had been posted to the enormous festival. They, too, generally mistook the initial shots for fireworks. With the first officers to realize the true nature of the situation being Officer Hutchison and Special Events Coordinator Rodriguez. They had been posted to the festival's command post and had used the vast network of cameras connected to it to search for the source of the fireworks, initially believing it to be some over-enthusiastic spectators or unruly local kids who were setting them off. 
These cameras gave them a full 360-degree view of the situation, and as they watched the people collapsing to the ground en masse, reality hit them like a train, with their system of cameras now forcing upon them the burden of coordinating the initial police response. Fortunately, Hutchison and Rodriguez proved to be competent, and as rounds continued to raid down, they identified casualties on their cameras and tried to make sure their fellow officers administered first aid in those precious life-deciding few minutes that come after being shot, saving dozens of lives in the process. In a further fortuitous turn, Hutchison and Rodriguez also managed to identify the source of the shooting, the constant muzzle flash standing out clear as day amidst the dark backdrop of the Mandalay Bay Hotel. They fed all of this information back to Central Command, who now found themselves with the unenviable task of having to coordinate the full response. Mercifully, that response was swift in arrival. Every single available officer in the police department was immediately scrambled to respond to the situation, forming a blue tidal wave of officers that surged toward the chaos with the inexorable force of a tempest ready to subdue the storm of violence that was wreaking havoc on the innocent festivities. Fortunately, by pure fluke of fate, there also just happened to be two police officers in the hotel when the shooting started. Officers Hendricks and Varsin, who had been in the process of arresting two women for trespassing when the shooting began, and thus were able to respond almost immediately. They formed a posse with anybody handy who happened to be present, namely security managers Alka, Scottill, and Umstart, as well as engineering supervisor Alsbury, and then stormed skywards as fast as the main passenger elevator could carry them, making sure to lock it behind themselves to help prevent civilians from getting caught in the crossfire. Inside the tight confines of the elevator, a confusion that mirrored the pandemonium outside swirled. It was all happening so fast. Campos's clear reporting on the positioning of the shooter had yet to reach the responding posse, and so with the shooter's exact position unknown, they did all they could do, cast a wide net and hope they caught him. Whispers of potential sights were thrown into the air, and it was decided to focus on the 29th through 33rd floors. This lack of precise intel made the experience rather unsettling for the posse. They had so many floors to search, and so many rooms and alcoves to pass, any one of them could be hiding a shooter waiting to greet them with a barrage of automatic fire. But daunting though it was, they pressed on. The madness had to end, and it had to end now, and they were going to do everything in their power to do just that. Then, when the doors finally opened on what must have been the slowest elevator ride of their lives, they set about their task. Initially, they went with silence, only getting a hint of the shooter's location when they reached the 31st floor, at which point the unending tide of rifle fire, through, though dim and muffled, could easily be heard above them. So for the last time, they pressed upwards. By now, it was 10.08. Three minutes have passed since the shooting began, and already 389 rounds have been discharged into the crowd. But at this point, the civilians at the festival were granted a brief reprieve, as for a time the shooter took his scope off them and turned it on the Karen Airport which sat right beside the hotel. His target oh, was the hulking fuel tanks that sat right on the airport's perimeter. He fired a single shot and, fortunately, cleanly missed. The rounds harmlessly cracking through the air, going over the fuel tank and disappearing off into the distance. Yeah, but it's the first round. The first round's just, a, he's like, okay, cool. And then he adjusts his scope or his aim, and then he knows what he's doing. But unfortunately, as we saw earlier, the shooter was a competent marksman, and so he adjusted his windage and elevation once again and began inching single shots ever closer to the fuel tanks. The fifth and sixth shots actually connected, striking a fuel tank on its top and bottom respectively. Mercifully, the rounds failed to penetrate, having lost so much velocity by the time they reached their target that they simply bounced off the thick steel skin of the tank, causing nothing but cosmetic damage. Given the fact that the two on-target rounds left scorch marks indicative of incendiary rounds, it is truly lucky that the tanks hadn't been built just a little bit thinner, or if the shooter had just been that bit closer, or else the story would have taken a very dark turn indeed at this point. How big are those tanks, and were the people around? I guess there must have been. This detour provided a small but precious window of time that, avail that allowed the evacuation and treatment of many civilians still on the ground at the festival. But this reprieve wasn't to last, and with it being clear that the fuel tank wasn't going to go up, the shooter blindly let off a further two rounds toward the airport, two rounds towards the airport in anger, and then returned his attention back to the festival, with the shooting resuming just before 10:10. It was at this point the campus's alarm would finally be answered, but not by the police security posse we discussed earlier, as they for some reason hadn't managed to climb a single flight of stairs in the two minutes the shooter had been focused on the on the airport. No, instead it was one engineer shock who would next be on the scene. Up until now. Shock had been blissfully unaware of the foul events unraveling on the 32nd floor. He was well aware that there was a weird noise, but on account of the many thick layers of concrete and steel that suppressed and distorted the sound on its way to him, he was unable to properly identify it, and so he assumed it to be the maintenance team hard at work on some task or another, and he paid it no heed. 
But then he strolled onto the 32nd floor, and the reality of the matter hit him like a train. He immediately disregarded his own safety and quickly charged in to investigate further. Fortunately for him, however, Campos shouted a warning of imminent danger from the alcove that he was still sheltered in, which gave Shuck just enough time to dive the cover as another hail of bullets tore through the door, leading to the shooter's suite. Having survived the volley unscathed, he attempted to crawl to another room for cover, but it was locked. So he did all that could be done. He kept his head down and he called his boss for help, grabbing his radio and desperately shouting, Shannon, call the police. Someone's firing a rifle on the 32nd floor down the hallway. But this sparks a couple of questions. Where the hell were the police? Why weren't they on the 32nd floor at the very moment, sending the shooter down to hell where he belonged? Well, they, they didn't know quite where he was, right? After all, they'd been perfectly positioned. Fate had put them in the lobby of the hotel right at the moment the shooter began his brutal massacre, and they were hardly dragging their heels in getting up there. So what gives? Well, in a word, incompetence. Not from those responding officers, mind you. By all accounts, their heroism and willingness to get themselves in harm's way to bring this madness to an end went absolutely above and beyond the call of duty. No, instead, it was one Officer Hendricks whose shoulders this fatal up lie on. In the police report, we get a single line on the matter. Officer Hendricks instructed everyone to move back. For a report which is otherwise so detailed, I found this shortness of detail peculiar, so I went digging some more, and it turns out, at the time this report was published, the 3rd of August 2018, he was under investigation and was later fired for actions, or lack thereof, on the night of the shooting. As this needless delay continued to drag out, the situation on the ground was only getting worse. Detective Clarkson, who was initially positioned on Las Vegas Boulevard and had promptly reacted to the initial shots, was searching for the ruthless perpetrator amidst the chaos, desperately searching for anything he could do to bring the madness to an end as bullets rained down around him. He soon found himself a direct target, and as the volume of fire landing around him made this fact abundantly clear, he took cover behind a patrol car and took a round to the neck. Tragically, this wasn't just a fate reserved for Clarkson either, as his comrade Officer Kirk also took a round that penetrated straight through his right bicep and came to rest in his chest. Fortunately, they both survived. The officers, still on their feet, were doing what they could to gain some control of the chaotic situation, leading people to exits, administering first aid to the wounded, and coordinating with off-duty medical personnel attending the concert. In a particularly bold display of heroic disregard for their own safety, officers to the west of the festival even formed a human barrier against the ever-oncoming fire. Tragically, however, Officer Hartfield, who was off-duty and attending the concert at a punter, as a punter, was fatally wounded during this action. Mercifully, at 10.15, after 10 long minutes, the shooting stopped, the end of the massacre being marked by the shriek of a single revolver shot as the shooter took his own life. Meanwhile, Back in the hotel, the police were finally getting a response figured out. The burden of heading up to Suite 32125 fell to Sergeants Richmond, Riddle, and Van Ness, who all rapidly assembled strike teams from available officers, and with unwavering resolve, traversed the chaotic Las Vegas Boulevard, cut through the Luxor Hotel parking lot, entered the Mandalay Bay, and began making their way to the shooter suite. Their task always to get Campos and Shark out of there. Fortunately, the pair were still alive and well, and they were both extracted from Floor 32 and sent to the hospital without further incident. Then, when a heat scan of 32-125 confirmed that the shooter was very much dead, the next thing to be done was to extract all of the civilians from the floor before they penetrated the suite. Again, this was done without incident, with there being a practically heartwarming moment when officers discovered a small infant alone in a room and swiftly reunited her with her grandma across the hall, much to the relief of everyone present. And then there was the main event, penetrating the suite. Immediately, they ran into an obstacle. Remember those baby monitors the shooter had set up? Um... No? <laughs> Wait, did you mention that, George? <laughs> I don't remember baby monitors. Wait, so he was monitoring stuff with baby- that- okay. Like, okay. Did I just gloss over that in my mind? Like, I have one of those moments where it's like, did I read something and just totally don't remember it? Or did George cut that at some point and then leave this hanging? Well, the officers weren't blessed with the power of hindsight like we are, so when they saw some modified electronic things with a load of wires poking out of it, they naturally assumed that it could be a bomb. Fortunately, one officer, Hancock, who was present on the floor, had experience on the bomb squad, so he was quickly able to relieve everyone's fears. Then there was the matter of the L bracket, keeping the door to the suite bolted shut. For this problem, a swift and direct solution was decided upon explosives. <laughs> Why not just unscrew it? As Lieutenant Hudler carefully applied the explosive to the door, the rest of the team prepared. Sure, they believed the shooter to be dead, but they were taking no chances. They had just seen what he was capable of, so Officer Newton crouched ready with a ballistic shield, with Sergeant Bitsko stood over him with a high-powered rifle. And after 30 seconds of waiting just to see if the shooter had any more tricks up his cold sleeve, Hudler flicked the switch, blew the door, and the team piled in through the resulting smoke, with Newton leading the charge. What followed 
was a grim exploration. Front and center was the shooter's cold, lifeless body, along with a blood-stained revolver lying on the carpet beside him. Not that you could see much of the carpet by that point, as the floor was practically filled with brass cartridge cases. Then there were the guns, as rifles upon rifles were strewn everywhere, all of this ominously topped by the howl of cold night air entering the suite through the smashed windows. But harrowing as the scene was, there would be time to document it later, as the officers had something much more pressing in their minds, making sure no other individuals were hiding in the suite waiting to give them a violent surprise. Fortunately, there wasn't. And with that, the scene was turned over to forensics, and the Las Vegas shooting was finally over. The shooter. Now, before we dive deeper into today's story, I need to make one thing blatantly apparent. I'm not naming the shooter in this video. This decision is rooted in my belief that the ones who are truly worthy of memor memorialization are his 60 victims. The shooter himself is little but a demon, wearing the skin of a human being, a parasite whose only notable contribution to the human experiment is the brutal extinguishing of five dozen innocent lives. And so they don't deserve to be remembered or f them. God willing, with this approach, I will do my small part in erasing their name from the cultural zeitgeist, because personally, I would be a very happy man in the near future if his name was invoked not in anger, not in rage, not in dis disgust, but absolutely not at all, his being becoming no more pertinent to history than the dirt that currently resides on the sole of my shoe. Yes, good way of putting it. Um, I don't remember this dude's name, and I'm happy it's this way, because f*** this guy. But I agree with you. They probably will be. There is also some method to my madness here, because while my decision is ultimately one based on emotion rather than reason, research done on the question of naming mass shooters would also imply my choice is the rational one. So let's now take a brief few minutes to overview this research, because it proves not just to be interesting for justifying my own choice not to name the shooter, but also provides valuable insight on how we should view and process mass shootings more generally. Okay, this sounds interesting. One theory of note is that of contagion. Within the context of a mass shooting, this theory suggests that there is a direct causal link between one mass shooting inspiring further incidents in its wake, akin to a copycat effect. For many years, specifically in the immediate post-Columbine years, this theory was the accepted rationale for pundits who chose not to name shooters, but it appears to have fallen out of vogue in recent years, having been made obsolete by more fleshed-out thinking and being criticized as simply ascribing a causal link oh, when it only really presented evidence of a correlative one. For a more nuanced understanding, we must look at generalized imitation theory. This describes the learned ability to perform behaviors similar to those observed or described even after some delay, creating a propensity for behaviors where previously there was none. Numerous factors can influence this propensity for imitation, including the model's perceived similarity to the observer, their social status, the rewards they receive, and their competence. Suddenly, with this understanding of the theory, we can see why my choice not to name the shooter would appear to be a most sensible one. Yeah, agreed. And I think like this is obviously something that happens all across the board. Isn't that it doesn't happen famously in like sports? Like if someone is really does like sets an incredible record, like way above, then everyone is lifted up because they were like, oh wow, humans can do that. Right? And I guess the same with shootings. If it's like, oh, this guy killed 60 people, huh, humans can do that. And then there's some psychos out there who are like, yeah, I can do that. I'm going to do that. And then this stuff happens, which is just horrible. It also makes my role as a content creator a somewhat burdensome one. Make no mistake, I always try to approach every topic I cover with respect and dignity. But never before have I tried to contend with the possibility that my content could play a small part in pushing an unstable person over the edge and lead to further tragedy. Truly, as a content creator, it is hard to imagine a more horrific consequence of my work, but unfortunately many in the media, both new and legacy, do not seem to be quite as conscientious with their reporting, and so there has been ample opportunity to discover exactly how generalized imitation theory plays out in the real world. One of the chief things that it discovered, rather morbidly, is that sloppy reporting can serve as an ad hoc training manual, with an unstable person effectively taking notes from media reporting, seeing what past shooters did right, where they messed up, and making refinements to their own plans accordingly. Naturally, I will not be naming past shooters who have done this. Yeah, and obviously, like I make jokes about like, how terrible criminals are and all the things they do wrong. I'm going to refrain from doing that because, well, for obvious reasons. Furthermore, it was also found that careless media reporting can, for lack of a better description, make a shooter sexy, as in their unrelenting crusade for eyeballs on their screens, they end up dramatizing the shooting to the point where it is depicted as some kind of high adrenaline, at times bordering on heroic last stand against all odds. I see nothing heroic about this. If you see stuff like this and you think it's heroic, there's something wrong with you. There really is. Like, if you look at things like this, or Sandy Hook, 
It's kids. If you see anything here about it, those are cowards. These are cowards. The most cowardly cowards. Yes, they deserve to die, and I hope they burn in hell! Disgusting human beings. For this reason, you will notice that in my recounting of the shooting, the actual descriptions of the violence tend to be pretty bare bones, short, sharp paragraphs, and rather plainly explained what he was doing and then moved on, with far more of the story's word count being dedicated to the victims and the heroes of the story. For those interested in knowing more, my sources for this chapter has been a paper titled Mass Shootings, the Role of Media in Promoting Generalized Imitation, written by doctors James Mindel and Jonathan Ivey. Should you be interested in more depth explanation of what I just discussed, this paper is freely available online. So now that my rationale behind not naming the shooter and some interesting wider context has been fully explained, let's get back to the ongoing story of Las Vegas. Eyewitness Accounts Now let's step back into the main narrative of our story, but now having already seen how the main series events played out, let's expand our understanding by zooming in and examining a few detailed witness accounts under the proverbial microscope. This will give us a valuable opportunity to appreciate the smaller, more nuanced details that did not fit our main narrative, the emotions, the reactions, and the split-second decisions that decided life or death during those ten long minutes. We're going to begin with Officer W. Stutzman of the Convention Center Area Command, who was posted to the festival and so found himself right in the heart of the unraveling horror. To keep things authentic, this account has been lifted word for word from the Operational Officer's Report, which is a sprinkling of editing from myself to remove technical police terminology that doesn't help our understanding. Oh, it's a long, oh, it's a long quote. Okay, here we go. On the day in question, I worked at the Route 91 Harvest Festival. I was, partner, I was partnered with Officer Tran, and we were assigned interior patrol west of the stage grass area. Our shift was scheduled from 1700 to midnight. We were standing next to the guardrail that separated the general access area to the VIP tents that was located on the west side of the venue. When the first shots occurred, Tran and I started walking south to investigate, and I was looking in the air because it sounded like fireworks. I remember a few LAPD officers that were hanging out with us who said, Get it, boys, as we walked away. While still walking toward the stage, a second volley went off, and I realized that something wasn't right. There were a few people standing around someone laying down on the grass to our left. We turned and looked and saw a female lying on her back with a gunshot wound to her right eye. A man was holding her head, and he looked at me and asked for help. The female's gunshot wound was bleeding severely. The blood was running and gushing out of her eye and spilling into her nose and mouth. At this point, Tran called out, an alert on the radio. I told the male to turn her onto her side so that she can breathe, and he said no, because she was having a seizure. The female was violently shaking. The third volley ran out, and I heard impacts hitting in front of me, unknown how far away they struck, but it seemed within ten feet. At this point, everyone started screaming, and I told everyone to move. The volleys were definitely coming from the hotel area and sounded like they were right outside the main fence. Tran and I ran back towards the VIP tent. There were people laying down and running for cover. Tran told some people to get down and knelt with them at the base of the tent. I continued to hear volleys, which sounded like they were coming from just outside the fence. I drew my weapon and ran up the stairs in the VIP tent because I knew there was another set of stairs at the south side. I was telling people to get down as I ran. After I went down the south set of stairs, I realized there was not an exit, so I ran along the perimeter fence northbound to reach gate 2. I exited through the gate and got behind a 4-5 to five foot brick wall that runs parallel with Las Vegas Boulevard. Then myself and another officer ran south along the wall. At this time, it still sounded like the shooter was close and I was trying to get to the threat. When we reached the end of the wall, we were at Mandalay Bay Boulevard. There were about five officers and ten civilians behind the wall. As more shots ran out, approximately seven more officers jumped over the wall, coming west to east to get behind cover. We now realized the shots were coming from an elevated position, and we were in a horrible spot. I told everyone around to remove their traffic vests. The shooting continued for what seemed like 30 minutes. We started telling all the civilians to move northbound and back into the grounds. There was a guy who could not stand or walk due to an unknown injury, and I, myself, and Officer Ryan Courtney, I think it was him, picked him up and ran him northbound, and then into the grounds where we dropped him off to other people that were helping. When the shooting finally stopped, there were three sergeants and about 15 officers. We split into groups of three and ran across the boulevard, going from cover to cover. On the other side of the boulevard, we jumped over a fence and ran through a parking lot on the west side of the boulevard. Two groups went in through the valet, and the strike team I was with entered through the House of Blues. At this time, we still thought there were multiple shooters and began to clear the casino floor of the Mandalay Bay. When we got to the Michael Jackson Theatre, we realized that there were 1,300 people inside. Due to the amount of people and the officers we had, we locked ourselves in the theatre and sat on the exit until we were cleared to go back for debrief. 
The account speaks for itself, and Officer Stodsman's own words do a far better job conveying the horror of the shooting than I ever could from the outside looking in. So now let's do the same again, but from a different perspective. The one of Officer Brosnahan, who was one of the SWAT officers who entered the Mandalay Bay to stop the shooter. Long quote again. I, Officer Brosnahan, operating as a uniformed SWAT officer, did respond to the Mandalay Bay active shooter event at 22 1500 hours. I was off duty when I received a text message from my supervisor, Sergeant Wiggins, stating that there was an active shooter at the Mandalay Bay and that I, along with the entire SWAT team, was to respond. I drove my unmarked Metro vehicle, logging on as I was en route. While listening to the radio, details were scattered and unclear as the number of shooters, their locations, and how many locations they had attacked. Rather than pulling up to the Mandalay Bay directly and into an ambush, a supervisor got on the SWAT radio channel and instructed all SWAT personnel to meet at the South Central Area Command to stage and deploy from there. Once arrived, the assistant team leader, SWAT officer Stevens, told me that he needed to deploy as a sniper, so I grabbed my sniper gear, including my LaRue 308 semi-automatic sniper rifle. I then linked up with SWAT officer Mickelson and drove in his truck to Mandalay Bay. We arrived at the Four Seasons entrance and immediately encountered 40-plus civilians taking cover and asking for help. Mickelson and I escorted the crowd to the boulevard and then directed them south towards the patrol perimeter. Mickelson and I then entered the Four Seasons entrance to Mandalay Bay. We were able to locate an elevator and took it to the 35th floor, the lowest floor that we could get to on that elevator. We had heard radio traffic that the shoot was on the 32nd floor and in a suite where he was shooting at the Route 91 Harvest Festival concert. Once on the 35th floor, we found stairs and took those down to the 32nd floor. We entered the hallway and immediately to our left found a suite at the end of the hallway with a partially open door. We didn't know if this was the suite the shooter was in, so we entered and checked the suite, not finding anyone inside. Mickelson and I then made our way to the central rotunda of the 32nd floor and contacted several officers and Mandalay Bay employees. They directed us towards the suspect suite. Looking down the wing of the suspect suite, oh, we could see at the end of the hallway the double doors to the suite. The left door, as you look at it, had dozens of bullet holes in it. We also observed that several patrol and plainclothes officers and one SWAT officer, O'Donnell, were halfway down the suspect hall and taking cover in the hotel room alcoves. Mickelson and I ran down the hallway to those officers and set up as a sniper team covering the suspect's doors. The officers informed me that they had not heard gunfire come from the room for several minutes. SWAT officer Hancock then broadcast that he was entering the suspect hallway from the stairwell next to the suspect's suite to hang an explosive breach. Mickelson and I covered their movements. The breach was detonated and the left door did come free from the hinges only hanging on the interior door return. The breach team then tore the door all the way down and slowly entered the suite. After the team entered, Mickelson and I were out of play. We were set to be a downed officer rescue team. Once the second charge went off inside of the suite and we heard a discharge of a firearm, Mickelson and I made the decision to enter the suite in case the team ran short of bodies. By the time we entered the suite and the adjoining room were cleared and the suspect was found dead inside. The suspect had apparently shot himself in the head with a silver revolver. Inside of the room, we observed at least 18 AR-style rifles with various types of accessories on them, hundreds of loaded rifle magazines, cameras attached to the backs of the doors looking through the peepholes, a table run from the bedroom of the suite into the suite, monitors, and various other items. There were hundreds of spent shell casings on the suite floor, a sledgehammer, and two broken-out windows, one in the main suite and the other in the adjoining hotel room. The suspect had also run two cameras to a room service cart that was still in the hallway. Hancock was able to locate the suspect ID and broadcast the info. I broadcast over the SWAT channel that the suspect had been located and that we used explosive charges and that the suite was clear. The suite was then turned over to uniformed patrol officers and Mickelson and I made our way downstairs to link up with other SWAT personnel to begin looking for additional suspects. We cleared a luggage storage slash valet area that several hotel guests, security and valet workers had taken cover in. Among the group was a security officer that had been shot in the leg on the 32nd floor. I escorted him to our SWAT doctor for treatment. The team I was with then cleared the staff area of the Mandalay Bay, finding two employees hiding in the manager's office. We escorted them to safety. We were then tasked, along with the entire SWAT team, to go floor by floor and clear every hotel room in the Mandalay Bay. Once the rooms were cleared, we all met back to debrief. And the quote ends. I didn't want to do the uninterrupted just because, well, one, it was extremely compelling and uh, interrupting quotes is, is sometimes a bit difficult. But it's like, I just wanted to say this guy was extremely well prepared with all the cameras and the monitors and an insane number of guns and ammunition. He must have been. I think I remember this. Like he was smuggling in, them into the hotel for ages, like going out and then coming back with like another suitcase and obviously like loading it up with guns. Right. But that's a load of guns to get into a hotel room. He must have gone out and hung that sign and be like, do not disturb. Please don't go in there. Please don't go in there. <laughs> They're very good at it. I think one time I hung do not disturb and they went in and cleaned my room anyway. Generally, when I stay in a hotel, if it's just like two or three nights, I'm always like, do not disturb. I don't need my bed made. I just don't want people rifling through my s***. 
So I'm always like, if I'm there for longer, then it's like, yeah, okay, you make up the room. But generally, I'm just like, it's okay. I'm just here for a couple of nights. I don't need my room cleaned every day. It's good advice. Like with Officer Stutzman's accounts, this came straight from the police officer's reports, and it gives us a lot of insight that simply wouldn't be possible if I were to recount his experience to you secondhand. Yeah, no, this was uh, this is probably the longest quote that we've ever had on Casual Criminalist, and I feel it, it works very well. I was I was gripped by it. It's very compelling. At this point, having now seen the testimony of both an officer who was on the ground at the scene and an officer who responded to it, I had hoped to make a nice, well-rounded trauma of perspective by finishing with a similar perspective from a civilian who was on the ground during the shooting. But unfortunately, I was unable to locate any during my search. The Las Vegas police certainly will have taken many such testimonies, but for whatever reason, I wasn't able to get my hands on any. But I still wish to repeat this valuable perspective. So what I've done instead is collate a small selection of short witness testimonies from contemporary news reports. Also note that most of the interviews consisted of back and forth questions and answers, which don't really lend themselves well to direct quotation in the manner we did for Officer Stutzman and Brosnahan. So I've combined them and paraphrased the original quotes while maintaining the language and context of the original quotes. First, we have an anonymous consigueur who spoke to ABC News and recalled the dread that consumed them when they realized that the noise that they had previously believed to be fireworks was not in fact fireworks. He then went on to recount how one of his friends was hit three times and he had to drag him under the stage to escape the continuing gunfire. Then, realizing that his friend was losing critical amounts of blood and couldn't afford to wait around for the gunfire to cease, he dragged his friend through the incoming bullets to get him aid. The pair made it to an improvised triage center without being hit any further. But sadly, his friend didn't make it and he died in his arms. Then there was Jamie Vasquez, who in an interview with Mary Claire revealed how she too had initially thought that the gunfire was fireworks, and when the grim realization hit her, she had absolutely no cover that she could easily flee to, so instead she made the brave choice to lie down on the ground, minimizing her profile to the shooter, and then during one of the shooter's many pauses to reload, she steered herself and fled the scene, not stopping running until she hit the safety of a police roadblock. Gail Davis proved luckier than most. Speaking to CBS, she recounted how her husband had immediately recognized the first few aim-adjusting shots taken at 10.05 as semi-automatic rifle fire, and so he immediately took her by the hand and made for an exit, getting a several-second head start on the majority of the crowd who initially mistook the gunfire for fireworks. Tragically, however, she also recounted seeing a girl beside her get shot and immediately collapse, a girl that she later discovered did not survive. Another anonymous consigueur, also speaking with CBS, describes the terrifying moment when mass panic consumed the festival crowd. They recalled seeing most people running with nowhere to go. The festival was packed shoulder to shoulder, and it was completely open with hardly any cover. But still, people instinctively just started moving, desperate to do anything and everything they could to escape the venue. They also recalled seeing a few brave civilians who disregarded their own safety and rushed to the aid of the casualties, doing anything they could to apply pressure to their wounds and buy them some more time. And speaking of bravery... This Clay Wilson, who in an interview with People magazine revealed how he had used his own body to protect his wife, pulling her to the floor as she panicked and positioning himself on top of her. Then, certain that death would come for him, he called his children amidst the shooting for what he was sure was a final goodbye. One can't help but admire Clay Wilson's strength and quick thinking in the face of imminent danger. To shield a loved one without a second thought while confronting the very real possibility of it being his last moments alive is an act of bravery that embodies the essence of these civilian recollections not mere anecdotes but an anthology of raw human endurance suffering and bravery even in the face of insurmountable odds so as we bring this section to a close we're now able to appreciate the true tragedy of the event in a way that we simply were not able to prior these experiences though unique all bear the same heart-rending undertones of fear of resilience, of tragic loss. So now let's move on from the event itself, and let's take a look at the police investigation that followed. Yes, as like as important as this is, it's so grim, and I like it when the police get. And the, the, obviously, this guy just shot himself like a coward, so there's no, you know, satisfaction of the arrest or anything. But let's look at the investigation. The police's first task following the shooting was to fully document the crime scene and recover every shred of evidence that it had to give. Naturally then, this also meant bagging and tagging the shooter's cache of firearms, which, as you may have ascertained, was unfathomably large. Twenty-four in total were recovered from the suite. Jesus Christ, that's a lot of guns, including 14 5.56 by 45 mm AR-15 type rifles from a range of different manufacturers, 8 7.62 times 51 mm AR-10 type rifles also from a different range of manufacturers, and one 7.62 by 51 mm Ruger American bolt action rifle and one 38 special Smith & Wesson 342 revolver. How is 
can you just buy as many guns as you want? This guy bought 22 assault rifles and a rifle and a revolver, and it's just like, fine. Anyone who's buying 14 AR-15s should be on some, like, what are you doing with 14 assault rifles? Now, if you know anything about firearms, you'll know that none of the aforementioned weapons are fully automatic, with the Ruger American being manually operated and the AR-10s and 15s all being semi-automatic self-loaders, which only deliver one round per trigger foot pull and therefore shouldn't have been capable of the exceptional rate of fire that the shooter was achieving. So, how did he do it? If I remember, this is something called a bump stock, and it is basically allows you to convert a semi-automatic weapon into an automatic weapon, which... I mean, surely that has to be massively illegal. But if I remember correctly, it's not. Which seems insane. Anyway, let's see. The police had this question too, and as they inspected his weapons more closely, they found their answers. Bump stocks and large capacity magazines. This terrifying combination, for all intents and purposes, allowed his semi-automatics to function as machine guns. With their initial catalogue of the firearms completed, the police's attention then turned to figuring out how and when each of the firearms seized from the hotel room had been used. A subsequent forensic investigation of the suite turns up 1,057 shell casings, which were meticulously studied to trace back to their firearm of origin. The analysis confirmed that 14 rifles had been fired during the incident, and will spare you the full list, but with most of the weapons having been fired for exactly or just under the amount of rounds its now empty magazine could hold, it appears as though the shooter's strategy was to have his cache of weapons lined up beside him, fire until its magazine was either empty or the weapon jammed, and then drop it and repeat with another weapon. Next on the to-do list was DNA. Every single item from the suite was collected and scraped for any trace of DNA, which the police hoped would allow them to ascertain if anyone else had been involved in the shooting. Wait, this is a hotel room. <laughs> like, as thoroughly as you clean that, a lot of people are in and out. And surely there's going to be a lot of DNA all over the show. You get that mischievous look in your eye. This seemed to prove conclusively that the shooter had acted alone. The only other DNA recovered besides his belonged to the hostel staff, all of whom quickly proved that they had absolutely nothing to do with the shooting thanks to watertight alibis and extensive supporting CCTV footage from the hotel. And then it was on to the digital evidence, which proved to be no small task. The detective sifted through 22,000 hours of CCTV footage and a whopping 252,000 images, which ultimately yielded just over 500 sightings of the shooter and allowed the police to build up a comprehensive understanding of his movements in the weeks leading up to the shooting. Oh my god, that is an extraordinary amount of how many people were working on this. I guess a lot, because it's the biggest mass shooting in history. They also dug into four laptops and three mobile phones that were discovered in the shooter's suite, revealing online queries including everything from biggest open-air concert venues in USA to more specific searches related to anticipated crowd sizes for music festivals, including Life is Beautiful and Route 91 Harvest Festival. They also found that they had sought out information on the height of the Mandalay Bay Hotel, various Las Vegas venues, SWAT tactics, and the performance of different types of ammunition over varying distances. Disgustingly, they also found several hundred images of child pornography. Br what? Why? What the? F why do you have to just? Why does this have to go in there? They also found evidence of a failed previous attempt to carry out another mass shooting, having discovered that the shooter had previously booked a hotel room overlooking the Lollapalooza Music Festival in Chicago's Grant Park in August. This reservation was mysteriously cancelled just two days before check-in. This. <laughs> why does this guy have so many mobile phones and hotels? And he's just like searching for. How do you not get on some sort of list? I always make that joke. It's like, oh yeah, if you know you're searching for like how to how to make a gun from plastic or whatever, you'd definitely be on some list and they should be pulling you aside at the airport. And I know there's like way too much information for this to ever be really maybe with like artificial intelligence and stuff, they're gonna be much better at this in some sort of like scary dystopian way, but hopefully less terroristy way. But I always joke that you should that you should get on some sort of list. But this guy's like, nah, he's just it's like if you were given those search terms, right? And just like, what's this guy planning? And you'd be like, well, he's going to plan a mass shooting of a music festival from a high story of a hotel, isn't he? That's what he's up to, which is insane. He doesn't use a VPN. What are you up to? But for all of this extensive searching, one thing was not discovered, and that was a motive. And all investigators could do was piece together possible motivations from whatever scraps of evidence they could find. One explanation that was floated was that the shooter was motivated by far-right political inclinations. Just a few days before the shooting, he was overheard discussing seminal far-right events, the Ruby Ridge standoff and the Waco siege, both of which catalyzed the anti-government militia movement of the 1990s. Additionally, a man who crossed 
pass with the shooter during an unsuccessful firearms transaction revealed that he had voiced strong anti-government sentiments ranting about FEMA camps, likening them to government-controlled concentration camps. He also supposedly saw the agency's operations after Hurricane Katrina as a guise for a larger conspiracy, a dry run for the law enforcement and military to start confiscating guns. Okay. These notions tie back to conspiracy theories originating in the radical right circles since the 1980s, casting FEMA as a puppet in the hands of the global elite, possing, plotting to usurp U.S. sovereignty. Isn't FEMA the environmental, like, Federal Environmental Management Agency? <laughs> I've no idea if that's correct, but I think it's got something to do with, like, in, in response to natural disasters. Why is there a conspiracy theory around this? <laughs> Is they just help people out. They're the people who said water when there's no plumbing working anymore. It's kind of nice having that kind of free time. Despite this, the investigators traded carefully and were reluctant to ascribe far-right tendencies as the shooter's definite motivation because it was just one of several possible explanations that they discovered. Another potential motivation was found in his family history. An FBI report suggested that the shooter was inspired, at least in part, by his father's reputation as a bank robber who once made the FBI's most wanted list, potentially leading to an extreme desire for infamy as a perverse interpretation of his father's criminal legacy. Yeah, robbing banks is a little bit different to mass shooting dozens of people isn't it? This potential explanation was compounded by his ex-wife, who indicated that he grew up in a financially unstable home with a single mother, resulting in an insatiable desire for attention that eventually mutated into the pure evil that unfolded on October the 1st. The FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit considered these possibilities for a couple of years, but eventually arrived at a complete dead end, closing the case in January 2019 without ever having decided on a motive for the mass shooting. That's crazy. We don't know why he did it. If you are my two cents worth on his motivation, he was an evil piece of shit, and frankly, I don't give a single toss about what inspired him to commit such an evil act. Isn't it? I, I'm, not, I'm not interested from like the personal perspective. I'm interested from like a professional perspective. Not that I'm a professional at this stuff, but you know what I mean. Like, what caused this to happen? What was wrong with him so we can consider this in dealing with the situation in the future? Right? Like, what... What... Because... Okay, maybe he was just an evil bastard, but maybe something, and the femur and the conspiracy, maybe he was just an evil, crazy conspiracy theorist. That seems like the most likely explanation, and then it's like, what are we supposed to do, fight against conspiracy theorists? And then they just think, we're part of the conspiracy. It's stupid. Conspiracy theorists are stupid. And sometimes, occasionally, right, which is kind of worrying. Have I been writing these scripts for so long that I have become jaded and cynical to the point that I get overly emotive when contemplating violent crime? Well, most certainly. But alas, it is what it is. And when I think about the 60 innocent lives that were extinguished because of this deranged demon, I find myself with not a single f left to give for his motivations. If you get Wi-Fi down in hell and are watching this unnamed shooter, know that as I write this, I'm laughing at you. Laughing at the pathetic waste of flesh and bone that was your life, and now I view you with all the pitiful contempt that I typically reserve for toddlers throwing tantrums. Now, following that much needed release of emotional pressure, let's take our attention off the shooter, who, even unnamed, has already occupied far too much of this script than he deserves, and instead uh, refocus on what really matters his victims. The victims. In the aftermath of any tragedy, it is vital to remember the victims, to recall the vibrant lives extinguished too soon, and to remind ourselves of the indelible imprints they left behind. In doing so, we humanize the numbers, we give meaning to the loss, we wrestle the victims from the clutches of oblivion, and we declare that they mattered and will continue to matter. Ordinarily, I immerse myself in this task. I learn about every individual. I commit to memory, their names, their faces, their smiles. I recount their stories. No matter how unremarkable or extraordinary they might be, I pay homage to them, to the life they led, to the people they loved, to the dreams they harbored. But today, I'm at a loss. Today, I'm confronted by a daunting task, a canvas vast and overwhelming, populated by 60 distinct strokes, each rightfully demanding its unique due, each victim was a universe in themselves, a constellation of experiences and aspirations that were abruptly extinguished. How, then, can I distill these diverse realities into a single narrative without blurring the lines of their individuality? So let us embark on this journey of remembrance together, bearing in mind that these stories, though a mere fraction of the toll, represent a whole, a mosaic of lives, irrevocably altered by a senseless act of violence. 
Think of Jack Reginald Beaton, a man whose final act was one of selfless love, his body becoming a shield to protect the woman he'd loved for 23 years. Then there was Christopher Lewis Roybal, a Navy veteran who traded the battlefields of Afghanistan for the neon lights of Las Vegas, only to lose his life away from the combat zones he'd survived. Turn your thoughts to Lisa Marie Patterson, whose faith and love for sports lit a beacon in her community, or to Adrian Allen Murphy, the jovial fisherman from Anchorage, dreaming of his own boat. And then there was Angela Gomez, a diligent nursing student with an infectious zest for life who had been at the very cusp of realizing her dreams. Consider the heartache of Austin William Davis's partner, mourning the loss of the man that she had expected to spend the rest of her life with, and Stacy Ann Etcheber, whose husband, a police officer, was robbed of the chance to protect his wife as he pledged to protect his city. Among the victims were also those who served their communities with dedication and passion. Heather Lorraine Alvarado, a member of the Cedar City Fire Department's Ladies Auxiliary, whose loss reverberated through her community. Charleston Hartfield, a police officer and National Guard member, who was slain while administering aid to the victims. And finally, there were those whose potential was so cruelly ripped away, like recent graduate Christiana Duarte embarking on a promising career with the Los Angeles Kings, or Kerry Lynn Galvin, a mother of three, who could recall every customer's order but was robbed of the chance to recall her children growing up. These are but the briefest sketches, incomplete and inadequate. Behind each name was a story, a family, a community that continues to reel from the devastating loss. Each death was a tear in the fabric of countless lives. Each absence is a gaping hole that can never be filled. These stories serve as a haunting reminder of the cost of hate and the price of indifference. Yes, in the midst of this profound tragedy, it's critical to remember that the essence of these victims isn't encapsulated in their deaths, but in the lives they led. They were parents, spouses, children, friends, neighbors, and colleagues. They were individuals who loved, who dreamed, who aspired, who left a mark on the world in ways big and small. While this account doesn't encompass all 60 victims, each one of them equally important, each story equally compelling. The sheer magnitude of the tragedy makes it impossible to delve into the narrative of every life cut short, yet they remain in our hearts, etched into our collective consciousness, standing as a testament to our shared humanity. As for non-fatal casualties, approximately 869 individuals suffered physical injuries, with the police investigation confirming that about 413 were a direct result of gunshot or shrapnel. A further 360 victims endured injuries not directly related to gunshot or shrapnel wounds likely due to the chaos and subsequent stampede caused by the shooting. Unfortunately, for nearly 96 victims, their specific type of injury couldn't be conclusively determined. In addition to this, the Las Vegas police also recognize all 22,000 festival attendees as psychological victims. I think we can speak for everyone on the team at the Casual Criminalist, as well as everybody watching this, in that we wish them well and Godspeed with their recovery. Conspiracy Theories Alright, this is a chapter that brings me no joy, but... It is a sad reality of the Las Vegas shooting that it has been the center of a great number of conspiracy theories over the years. I hate these people. Like, conspiracy theories, fine. Have your fun. But when it's like around mass shootings, like, uh, f***ing Alex Jones and his Sandy Hook, it's just like, you're not, this isn't harmless, you're hurting people. Which was uh, nicely encapsulated by that huge legal settlement, not settlement, legal fine or whatever that he got. It wasn't like over a billion. <laughs> God damn. Well deserved. Initially, I wasn't going to include this chapter at all and not fuel the fire, but after further contemplation, I opted to do so for two reasons. Firstly, because whether we like it or not, it is a part of the story, and I'm going to bring you a fully representative account of the shooting. I have to include it. But secondly, and more importantly, I'd rather you hear it from me first, a writer who isn't trying to sell you any snake oil or wacky narratives. That way, you can be introduced to and ultimately learn to combat the conspiracy theories rather than potentially find yourself susceptible to them later down the line. The first conspiracy theory came from the minds of Brad Johnson, a retired CIA officer, and Rich Higgins, a former Pentagon official. They first entered the story about a month after the shooting, when they, along with a number of associates, created a 51-page PowerPoint presentation, which according to its synopsis used open-source information with tactical counterterrorism analysis, cyber intelligence, and data mining capabilities to explain what they claimed to be the reality of the Las Vegas shooting, as you've probably already ascertained from its inclusion in the chapter, it was kind of a complete crock of bollocks. Really? These are two, like, a retired CIA officer and former Pentagon official? These sound like serious dudes. But where their claims get really dark, however, is when they named a completely innocent man who was nothing but an innocent bystander at the massacre as in fact being complicit in the shooting, claiming that he had acted as a middleman between Antifa and ISIS, both of them, they alleged, were the real masterminds behind the disaster. 
wait, did they claim this? These are kind of, isn't, I don't know about Antifa, but isn't ISIS kind of like, if this happens, they're like, yeah, it was us. We did it. Their big brained irrefutable evidence of this claim? A social media post of it meeting at a Turkish restaurant, and no, I'm not even being hyperbolic here. That was literally their proof. That is not proof he's eating at a Turkish restaurant. Obviously, this was utter nonsense. The video's main source is a 187 page document that was the result of a nearly year long investigation process and collated thousands of pieces of evidence from DNA to ballistics and from CCTV footage to phone records. And at any point in this video, have I mentioned any sort of co conspirator? Well, no, because there wasn't one. But unfortunately, nonsense it may have been, but this conspiracy theory spread like wildfire online, and soon enough the inferno was out of control. The man in question, naturally keen to have nothing to do with this utter drivel, privated his social media accounts and tried to get on with his life, but unfortunately, this was akin to waving a red flag to a bull as those rapidly dogging him took this as an admission of guilt. I would sue those people who came up with this so hard, like Sandy Hook victims, families, to Alex Jones because you're ruining this guy's life. And if all of this wasn't bad enough, the story was then picked up by Laura Luma, a rather controversial internet personality, at which point the wildfire escalated into more of an atomic blast. I've never heard of Laura Luma, and I assume it's because she's peddling this kind of conspiratorial nonsense they've got no interest in. So, probably, why? And the harassment against him only continued to grow. His family and friends advised him to simply ignore the fervor and get on with his life. But eventually, the stress of a total lack of privacy and constant death threats grew too great for the poor man, and he went to the FBI for protection. As if this wasn't bad enough, the conspiracy theory only continued to grow, even eventually finding itself entertained by actual, real-world, not-online public figures, such as various anchors on a particularly litigious news channel – you know exactly which one, even if we don't name it – and even Congressman Scott Perry. Mercifully, the hate train eventually put on its brakes and pulled into a siding, and the unnamed innocent man was able to go about the rest of his life in peace and is alive and well to this day. Why? What did they? They were just suddenly like, nah, it's okay, we'll leave the guy who we think was a consp- like conspirator alone. I guess the conspiracy theory, people just got bored. That's strange. If nothing else, the unfounded accusations that nearly ruined an innocent man's life underscore a grim facet of our internet-driven era. Innocent bystanders can find their lives upended due to baseless conjecture, magnifying the distressing aftermath of a tragic event. Once a narrative takes root in the fertile ground of the internet, it can prove disconcertingly resilient, irrespective of the protestations and evidence of those wrongfully accused. And, of course, such baseless speculations are also an insult to the many innocent lives lost. Another conspiracy theory that gained traction in the aftermath of the Las Vegas shooting posits that the nameless gunman was not the actual perpetrator. Instead, it was suggested that he was set up as a patsy or scapegoat by some larger, more sinister entity, whether it be the government, the deep state terrorist organization, or some other shadowy group. At the core of this theory lies the belief that the scale, precision, and lethality of the attack far exceeds the capabilities of a single man. Theorists often cite the number of guns found in the hotel suite and the rapid-fire nature of the attack, asserting these factors imply a degree of skill and planning beyond the actual shooter's perceived abilities. Additionally, some theorists latch on to perceived inconsistencies or ambiguities in the official timeline of events and law enforcement reports, for instance, the delay in police breaching the hotel suite or conflicting initial reports about the number and nature of the shooter's injuries are often cited as evidence of a cover-up. Another branch of this theory focuses on the lack of an established motive for the perpetrator's actions. Theorists argue that the absence of an apparent reason for him to carry out such a horrific act fuels suspicion that he was not the true perpetrator, but rather the fall guy for a covert operation or a broader conspiracy. These theories, while prolific on certain internet forums and social media platforms, lack substantial evidence and are largely built on speculation misinterpretation, and a profound distrust of official narratives. The consensus among law enforcement and credible media outlets is that the man that we have been talking about for the last hour was indeed the shooter, and any suggestion otherwise is a product of conspiracy theorizing. What's more, we don't even have to defer to the media to believe this. Once again, this video's main source is an extensive 187-page investigative document published after the attack, and all the pages are filled with CCTV stills of the shooter moving bags upon bags full of firearms into his room and various other clear-as-light evidence that fully debunks the conspiracy. Now, as we bring this chapter to a close, we must remember that unchecked conspiracy theories are not just an annoyance. They are a peril. They can incite fear, stoke divisions, and harm innocent individuals. They are a symptom of deeper societal fissures, a manifestation of our struggle to navigate an ever-changing socio-political landscape where the line between truth and falsehood is continually blurred. In the final reckoning, the Las Vegas shooter's story has been obscured by the fog of conspiracy, which is itself a tragedy. 
This haze of baseless accusations and misinformation serves as a stark reminder of the need to reassess our digital discourses, navigational tools. It underscores the urgency of discerning truth from fiction and treating each other with respect in the complex arena of online interaction. In the end, this is not just about ourselves. It's about honoring the memory of those impacted by such horrific events and not insulting their memories by peddling baseless and easily debunked conspiracy theories. The Fallout The Las Vegas shooting served as a potent catalyst for the rekindling of national debates on gun control. Legislative responses varied from state to state, but in many areas there was a palpable push for more stringent gun control measures. Doesn't this happen every time? It's like there's a mass shooting, people die, kids die, innocent people are slaughtered. And then it's like there's a talk about gun control or like some sort of limitations and stuff like that. Doesn't it just seem like nothing's happening? And then like a couple of years later, something else horrific happens and they're like, yeah, let's do something about that. Nothing ever happens because these keep mass shootings keep happening. And and honestly, I don't know much about like gun control or anything like that. I'm not American, so it's hard for me to comment other than like it'd be nice to see people getting shot less. Um, but it doesn't. Is it is it necessarily a problem with the guns being like i live in a country which has similar gun laws to america but there's not people getting shot all the time and it makes me think that it's not the guns it's something else for some reason this this happens in america more and i don't know what that reason is Nevada, the very state scarred by the massacre, stood at the forefront of this legislative movement. In February 2019, Governor Steve Sisolak signed a bill into law that expanded background checks to private gun sales and transfers, effectively co closing the so-called gun show loophole. Following the devastating incident in Las Vegas, then-President Donald Trump also took decisive steps to address part of the firearms issue. On December the 18th, 2018, his administration officially announced a regulatory ban on bump stocks. How were those legal in the first place? Jesus. They're just for turning a semi-automatic weapon into an automatic weapon, right? And automatic weapons are not allowed. So how about no? How about how has that ever been allowed? The new regulation amended the definition of a machine gun in the Gun Control Act, GCA, and National Firearms Act, NFA, to include devices that allow semi-automatic firearms to shoot more than one shot with a single pull of the trigger by harnessing the recoil energy. Consequently, the possession, sale, and manufacture of bump stocks became prohibited under federal law. Existing owners were given a 90-day grace period until the 26th of March 2019 to either destroy their devices or turn them into Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. Beyond these two instances, however, legislative changes were relatively minimal. Despite the limited federal action, the incident had an indelible impact on the ongoing discourse surrounding gun control. It served as a stark reminder of the potential devastation wrought by firearms and the urgent need for comprehensive and effective regulation. Today, the incident continues to reverberate through the national conversation on gun control, contributing to an ongoing debate that seeks to balance individual rights with collective safety. There were also lawsuits that resulted from the shooting, with one example being launched by Miri Parsons, mother of the late Carrie Parsons, one of the 60 victims of the tragedy. This launched a legal challenge against several gun manufacturers and dealers. Defendants included industry giants such as Colt, Daniel Defense, and Patriot Ordnance Factory, all of whom had produced firearms used during the massacre. The lawsuit, which demanded damages exceeding $50,000 per plaintiff and called for a jury trial, argued that these companies knowingly sold firearms like the AR-15, which could be readily converted into an almost automatic weapon using a bump stock. Despite a compelling argument by the Parsons attorney highlighting the lethal potential of these modified weapons, the Nevada Supreme Court sided with the gun companies. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I get why they did. Because it, they're, they're selling guns that are legal, and bump stocks were legal some f***ing how. So it sucks. I think it's not right, but that's what the law was. Citing Nevada, Nevada Revised Statutes 41.131, Justice Christina Pickering stated that these companies were protected from wrongful deaths and negligence claims unless the deaths resulted directly from a manufacturing defect. The decision underscored the legal safeguards for gun companies and underscored the need for potential legislative changes in the future. Another lawsuit was settled in July of 2019 when MGM Resorts International, the parent company of the Mandalay Bay Hotel, reached a monumental settlement agreement with the victims of the mass shooting. The hotel agreed to pay out up to $800 million to the victims, making it one of the most substantial financial resolutions of its kind. This is a... Uh, what, what were Mandalay Bay expected to do? They couldn't have reasonably foreseen this. Just... 
I, this is a horrible tragedy. And I have an extraordinary amount of, vic- of sympathy for the victims and the victims' families. But I'm not quite sure how Mandalay Bay should have an $800 million liability here. The settlement, the result of a grueling two-year negotiation period, was slated to cover the trauma and loss suffered by approximately 4,400 relatives and victims. An independent third party was commissioned to distribute the funds based on factors like the severity of injuries and the impact on the victim's quality of life, a process which brought some modicum of justice, albeit through financial compensation, to those affected. I don't really know if that's justice. It's not coming from the person who perpetrated this act. It's coming from the place that it took place which i don't know i don't i I don't really understand in the aftermath of the tragedy the hospitality industry also went under a transformative reassessment of its security measures the shooting had opened up a contentious debate about hotel liability prompting many establishments to reevaluate and bolster their security procedures i mean what are you supposed to do like scan people's luggage when they come into a hotel it's not an airport Practices that were once commonplace began to shift. Routine room checks became more frequent, providing an additional layer of safety for guests and hotel staff. Do not disturb signs, previously respected as inviolable, were now subject to stricter policies that balance guests' privacy with the overall safety of the hotel. I'd be inclined just not to stay in a hotel with random room checks and people just going into my room when I'm staying there. I understand that it's their property, but I have a st- <laughs> there's some degree of privacy that I'd, I'd like. If I'm staying somewhere. These changes, while subtle, underscored the industry's commitment to preventing a recurrence of such a tragic event. Wow, okay. Um, okay. So this ends the story of America's worst mass shooting, a bitter tragedy in which 60 innocent people lost their lives. 869 suffered life derailing injuries, and thousands more suffered psychological trauma, the likes of which we cannot even begin to truly comprehend. Uh, this is normally the part of the video where I tie things off in a neat little bow. Maybe try to figure out some silver lining to the cloud, or in some way try to lessen the absolute punch to the gut that was the last hour or so of our lives. But somehow such an ending doesn't quite feel right today. So instead, let's bring this episode to a close in the only way that's truly appropriate. As ever, some ramblings on how I researched this piece. As I always do, I initially started my research by looking up secondary literature on the topic, and for a case as high profile as this, I was shocked to discover there basically isn't anything of value on this topic. All I found was a bunch of cash grab Wikipedia copy and paste ebooks, and that's about really it. Apologies if you're the author of a really well researched book, I just happened to miss somehow. With that in mind, I was ready to send Simon my least favorite kind of email, the kind where I have to scrap an interesting proposal because the information simply isn't out there to do it justice, because surely. I imagined primary documentation for such a high profile and such a recent event wouldn't be available yet. Well, that assumption of mine proved to be rather wrong, as I uncovered an absolute treasure trove of primary information during my research, including but not limited to the official police report written following the end of the investigation in 2018, or 187 pages of it, 173 pages of officer reports detailing the accounts of officers the night of the shooting, 147 pages of civilian witness encounters with the shooter, and inches upon inches of legal paperwork related to the lawsuit. As a result, I'm proud to say that I believe this is the first piece I've ever written for this channel which is entirely primary source derived. This is brilliant. Thank you, George. I mean, primary primary source stuff and digging it out, I know it's a lot of work, so I really appreciate it, and I imagine the audience do as well. Thank you. Thank you, George. You also may find how I've referred to some of the characters in today's video a bit odd, for example, rarely mentioning the first names of police officers. This was a very specific choice on my part. As so much of this video has been drawn from police documentation, I wish to to respect the privacy by only mentioning the aspects of them that were already in the public domain. Where I've used someone's full name, it's because they themselves already willingly put it out in the public, usually in a period news interview or something, or I found them on LinkedIn and they gave me the thumbs up. Brilliant research, George. As always, thank you so much. Um, And thank you, everybody, for watching. Heavy episode today. I'm just going to end it there. See you next time.